I have been putting this together for the last week, but planning it out for the last six months. Today, we're finally going to put it all together and turn it on. This is Epic Genoa. Today's video is brought to you by me. Check out craftcomputing.store for all of my official merch and help fund the content that you enjoy watching here on the channel. From custom laser engraved pint glasses to coasters and whiskey stones, and even our brand new double wall insulated coffee tumblers, all of my merch is designed 100% in-house and made to order by me. I'm also now offering flat rate international shipping to 23 different countries, and if you live in the continental US, free shipping on orders over $35. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to craftcomputing.store and start drinking like a pro. Cheers, everyone. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. It has been five years since the release of AMD's Epic ROM CPUs, a lineup that featured AMD's first 64-core CPU in the Epic 7742. It's a CPU that I've covered many times here on the channel, and for good reason. It's basically been the gold standard for highly dense virtualization servers, even this many years later. AMD's third generation in Epic Milan was a decent step forward, but I'd say fell short of a generational leap. It certainly wasn't a platform I'd consider upgrading to if I already had an Epic ROM stack in deployment. Now I know I'm a bit late to the party on this, but in November of 2022, AMD announced their fourth generation Epic CPUs known as Genoa. Based on AMD's Zen 4 architecture, it's not only a massive step forward in performance, but the connectivity potential is absolutely off the charts. Where second generation Rome and third generation Milan ran on DDR4 3200 memory, Genoa made the leap to DDR5 4800, but even more significantly, now has 12 channel support instead of just eight. For memory reliant applications, that means per CPU socket, there's up to 225% more memory bandwidth available on Genoa. But where things get really interesting is in storage and networking expansion, thanks to the jump to PCI Express 5.0. Genoa CPUs have a full 128 lanes of PCIe 5.0 at their disposal, which again more than doubles the potential bandwidth for storage and networking over previous generation platforms. But like I said, I am a little bit late to this party, so I don't want to repeat too much information that you might have already heard. If you are interested in the platform differences between Rome, Milan, and now Genoa, I will link Level 1 Techs, Patrick at Serve the Home, as well as George over at Chips and Cheese down in the video description. Go give all of them a look. Now, a large chunk of my server use revolves around general virtualization with a specialty in VDI, and that's where I'll be focusing most of my attention. But today, this video is all about putting this box together. Now, this is by far one of the largest and most expensive builds I have done on this channel to date, and there are quite a few companies to thank for bringing this project together. And it starts with AMD for providing the Epic 9554 CPU. This is their top tier 64 core SKU rocking 128 threads, 256 megs of L3 cache, and a relatively insane 3.75 gigahertz max boost frequency, all in a 360 watt TDP package. I requested this CPU specifically from them all the way back in December for VDI testing, but I really didn't think that they'd actually send one over, so huge shout out to AMD for the opportunity to check this out. Of course, getting the CPU in hand was only the first part of the battle. Then came all the work of getting all of the other parts together to actually put this thing together. And I don't know if you know, but cutting edge server gear tends to be fairly expensive. First off, ASRock Rack agreed to send over their Genoa D8X2T motherboard. If you've seen my videos around Epic Rome, those were also powered by ASRock's predecessor to this motherboard in the Rome 8DT. I wanted this motherboard specifically for the PCI Express layout, as it's incredibly flexible for VDI testing, with seven PCI Express X16 slots, a bonus X8 slot on top, a pair of M.2 NVMe slots, and four MCIO connectors, all of which run at PCI Express 5.0 speeds on this board. That selection of ports will let me run up to three dual slot GPUs or up to seven single slot cards, whether they be GPUs, storage adapters, or network cards, and all of them on X16 lanes. And yes, I have some plans that might utilize all eight slots on this board eventually. More on GPUs towards the end of this video. One of the difficulties in rolling out PCI Express 5.0 on motherboards is not in the CPU or even the PCI Express controller itself. It's signaling down to the PCI slots themselves. It's actually the main reason most consumer boards don't even offer PCI Express 4.0 support to every slot. 
they physically can't maintain proper signal that far away from the CPU. So we wind up with only the top NVMe and PCI Express X16 slots fully supporting 4.0 speeds, let alone 5.0 speeds. The Genoa DAX2T motherboard solves this with a massive grid of Fizon PS7101 chips, which act as signal repeaters for PCI Express 5.0, ensuring that every single port on the board can actually run at 5.0 speeds. As far as expansion potential, the sky is literally the limit as far as NVMe storage and networking is concerned, which is why I was actually a little shocked at the complete lack of onboard I.O. on this server. Sure, there are dual Broadcom 10 gigabit Ethernet ports, a VG8 port for video output, a dedicated IPMI for out-of-band management, and that's about it. If you need USB ports, there are two on the rear, and that's pretty much it. You get two ports on the rear and a single USB 3.2 header for the front I.O., which means even doing something as simple as installing an operating system from a USB might be a little difficult. If you were wanting to run all of that PCI Express expansion potential in a workstation, this is likely not the board for you unless you go out and start populating some PCI Express slots with USB controllers. But as far as a server, this system is going to be right at home. One compromise to get the Genoa D8X into a motherboard even approaching standard size was to drop four of the memory channels. So rather than a full 12 channels that you would normally see on Genoa CPUs, we only have eight channels available. Now that's not going to slow us down too much, as remember, we're still running DDR5 4800 registered ECC DIMMs here. In fact, Serve the Home has a wonderful breakdown on this particular motherboard, and some performance comparisons of 8-channel versus 12-channel running on the Epic 9654 96-core Genoa chip. I'll be sure to include a link to that down in the video description as well for those interested in the performance differences. But even cutting down from 12 channels down to 8, this is still a massive motherboard. It is an EEB motherboard, which is both longer and taller than an EATX. Now, part of that compromise was to make sure that every single slot got PCI Express 5.0, as there is a ton of real estate reserved just for PCI Express signaling. Overall, still being able to provide an EEB-sized motherboard that will still fit into off-the-shelf cases, I think all of the necessary compromises were made, and I'm more than happy with the results here. Speaking of memory, that was one of the most difficult things to get a hold of for this project. If you're a home labber and think even used DDR4 ECC memory is expensive, you've never tried buying brand new server memory before. As it turns out, every server memory OEM that I had contact information for wasn't too keen on sending me eight sticks when they could just sell it in quantities of 10,000. So I was stuck in my usual conundrum. Do I spend two months of project budget on memory so I can review the Epic 9554, knowing I will never recoup those costs, or do I just keep searching for a partner willing to send me some memory? As it turns out, back in April, Corsair announced that they were entering the workstation memory market, and were going to be making DDR5 ECC DIMMs intended for Threadripper. So it goes without saying a huge shout out to Corsair for sending me over 256 gigabytes worth of DDR5 registered ECC 5600 memory. Officially, Epic Genoa CPUs support memory up to 4800 mega transfers per second, and that's where I'm running this kit right now. There are some options in the BIOS for potentially pushing the memory up to 5600 mega transfers per second, but I haven't fussed with them too much yet. Not that I'm at all disappointed with memory bandwidth here. We're looking at nearly 260 gigabytes per second reads and writes thanks to the jump to DDR5. That's up from my fastest test on an Epic 7742, which clocked in at around 190 gigabytes per second, running eight channels of DDR4-2933. That means just architecturally and channel for channel, we're looking at nearly a 35% bandwidth improvement between Epic Rome and Milan and the leap to Epic Genoa. Now, another major consideration to a system like this is with power and cooling. As you might have guessed, even with an all-core boost clock of just 3.75 GHz, we're still dealing with a 360W TDP chip. For the chassis, I reached out to Inwin and they were happy to send over the IWR400-03N, a 4U rack mount chassis that should be very familiar to those who have watched the channel before, as I use the sibling to this, the R400, in my Epic Rome build, but there are some key differences to point out here. First off, the power supply. The R400 that I used on the Epic Roam supports a standard ATX power supply, which allowed me to use a 1600 watt unit from Be Quiet for most of my GPU testing. And I actually hated that unit for rack mount use. See, the Be Quiet 1600 used a C19 power plug, and that plug wants to fall out of the back of the server if you look at it wrong. 
Just jiggling cables around is enough to knock it loose. So a common step to working on the backside of my server rack was to plug the Epic Roam server back in and make sure it powered on. Every single time. The R400 03N accepts a standard 2U power supply, which means I can use units like this. This is a dual 1200 watt modular supply, which is also available from Inwin. Well, these are kind of 1200 watt power supplies. See, here in the US, our standard domestic power delivery is 110 volts instead of 220. At 110, these will only output 800 watts. But I'm actually planning on upgrading the server circuit in my garage to 220 volts in the very near future. But for now, I'll just need to keep the power draw from this server in check. Coming back to that 360 watt TDP on the Epic 9554, surprisingly enough, we don't need a hugely exotic cooler to keep it in check. For a heatsink, I picked up an XE04 SP5 from Silverstone. It's a standard 92 millimeter fan and heatsink combo designed to fit inside of a 4U chassis. And honestly, I have been more than impressed with it in some early testing here. Under a Cinebench R23 stress test, we see an average of 3.35 gigahertz clock speeds after 10 minutes, an average CPU core temperature of 63 degrees Celsius with a max observed of 73.8. That was with an average power draw of 274 watts, which is actually well below the rate of TDP of 360 watts, though that is a very common result in R23 among Epic CPUs. Taking a look at the results from Cinebench R23, it's easy to see just how big of a jump Genoa is from previous generations. In multi-threaded performance, the Epic Genoa 9554 managed a score of 85,573 against just 52,765 from the Epic Rome-powered 7742. Now, while I don't have an Epic Milan chip to compare to directly, CPU Monkey reports the 7763 64-core CPU as having a score of 61,455. Power draw is also very interesting between Epic Rome and Genoa. The Epic 7742 drew just 192 watts on average during testing, while the Genoa 9554 pulled in 274 watts. That is 41% more power, but also results in 62% more performance overall. But for those who don't need quite as much raw performance, there's also AMD's Bergamo platform, which I reviewed last year. Now there's one more thing that I want to touch on in this video, and that's storage. Saying you can load this up with Gen 5 storage is one thing. Showing it in action is another. For that, Corsair also sent over four of their MP700 Pro 2TB Gen 5 NVMe drives. These are rated at a mind-numbing 12,400 megabyte per second reads, 11,800 megabyte per second writes, and up to 1.5 million 4K random IOPS. One of the main struggles I've had with VDI solutions, like cloud gaming, is the intense load on storage for loading the OS or launching a game. Now I've ran up to four Gen 4 NVMe drives in an array, and those were rated individually at 7,000 megabyte per second read speeds and 650,000 IOPS. But after launching more than five or six simultaneous VMs, which really stressed the read speeds on the server, things didn't work out so well. Load times in games would vary wildly from 15 seconds to upwards of two minutes in some circumstances. Other times I would actually have intermittent crashing of games where if I'm running just a single OS would run just fine. I'm really curious to see long term what doubling the read speed and tripling the IOPS in these drives does for the array overall. For testing today, I've got a single 240 gigabyte Gen 3 drive running the OS and four of the MP700 Pros installed into an Aorus 4-way NVMe carrier. I've used their Gen 4 carrier in previous projects and have been a big fan of the design. Now again, remember this is all a very quick setup and testing just inside of Windows. I'll be doing more in-depth testing once I start configuring the server for deployment. For single disk speeds, the results are impressive to say the least, and basically bang on with what was advertised from Corsair. In Crystal Disk Mark, we're getting sequential reads of 12.1 gigabytes per second, sequential writes of 10.9 gigabytes per second, with 32Q 4K random speeds of 510 megabytes per second. But of course, I'm not interested in single disk speeds here. My plan is to run four of these drives, likely in ZFS in a RAID Z1. OpenZFS is currently in beta for Windows, so I figured I'd give that a go here and spun up a 6TB RAID Z1 array. Crystal Diskmark didn't want to play nicely with this configuration though, and it was returning results of around 1200 megabytes per second. So I switched over to Disk SPD. In a 16 thread read test, I'm seeing around 21 gigabytes per second combined reads with an average of 4.1 millisecond latency. 
Now that might not sound too impressive considering we're moving from a single disc at 12 gigabytes a second to four discs and only 21, not even doubling the performance. I thought the same thing, so I retested a single MP700 Pro in disk SPD with the same settings and saw roughly 7.2 gigabytes per second, or around one third the speed we see when matched in an array. Now obviously storage speed and latency are still going to take quite a bit of time to suss out before I'm ready to slap them in and call this a VDI rig. But those are still some very impressive results here in the very early going. So that's the base hardware that I'm going to be playing with for the next couple of months as I continue diving into cloud gaming and VDI solutions. In my last couple of videos on the subject, even when running NVIDIA Pascal series GPUs, we're starting to see Broadwell CPUs becoming a CPU bottleneck. Obviously, we're going to see some much improved results on Epic Genoa, but Pascal is a bit out of date at this point, if I'm being honest. While I am planning on retesting those Pascal GPUs in the P40 and P100 just to see what improvements can be made with a CPU upgrade, it's not really realistic that anyone out there is going to be running a Pascal GPU in a Genoa server. So I think it's time we brought out some bigger guns and went a little bit more modern. For that, I have a pair of RTX A5000 Ampere Power GPUs, and I've been testing them with VDI Solutions for almost the last six months now, and I can't wait to see what a modern GPU can do inside of a modern system. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that one, because uh, that's going to be fun. Now besides VDI, what else do you guys want to see with this system? Uh, it's going to take a while for me to figure out how to properly stress all 64 cores in this rig and make it relevant to both small medium business and home labbers. So let me know down in the comments below what you want to see me run on here. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. And as a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. But that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Beer for today was sent over by long-term supporter of the channel, Malbeth. Uh, and when I say long-term, I mean one of my first 10 or 15 patrons and has been supporting me since 2018. So uh, thank you, Malbeth. Uh, this is from Pit Caribou Brewery up in Quebec, Canada. Uh, it is the La Gaspine, uh, which translates roughly to Girl from Gaspi. Uh, number 13, Robust Porter or Strong Beer, clocking in at 6.2%. And yes, I know I butchered that name. I don't speak French. Ooh. It's like a brown ale, but a little spicy. Man, I have been thoroughly enjoying this beer. This is so freaking good. They say this is a robust porter, uh, but here on the bottom it says strong beer. Oh, there is actually a description here in English on the can. I didn't catch that before. Round-bodied, robust porter offering chocolate and coffee notes along with a sweet finish. Gaspinenses? Whatever. <laughs> Are historical fishing boats that uh, crisscross the St. Lawrence River at the time of the cod fishery. Yeah, definitely more of a porter. I said right when I put, put the can to my nose, right after I poured this. It smells like a brown ale that's a little bit spicy. Um, and that continues on. You do get, I won't say chocolate. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop them at chocolate. But you do get a little bit of coffee and a lot of some really well-rounded, earthy, malty flavors to this. And then it's almost like a, a touch of cinnamon and cardamom. Like it's, it's a little bit like aromatic bitters kind of style. This is just super good. Very, very rich coffee. Very, very black coffee flavor. Maybe not the best introduction to dark beers as this one, this one hits pretty hard, uh, even at only six and a half percent. But man, this is delicious.